So my name's Alan McIntyre and uh, I'd like to start by uh, thanking you for the opportunity to come here and, and uh, participate in this, this great meeting and, and see some of the work that you're doing here. Uh, so as well as being here uh, in the, my role as a researcher, I'm also here as, in my role as Deputy Head of Division Research Director and Global Engagement Lead of my division, the Division of Cancer and Stem Cells in the School of Medicine at the University of Nottingham. So I thought I'd start by just saying something about the, uh, the division. Uh, the, the division has 35 academic research groups and about a third of these are clinical, uh, uh, led by clinical academics, so we've got a lot of clinical input. Uh, and this includes 14 senior professors. So on the left hand side I've, I've highlighted some of the major uh, cancer types that we work on. Uh, we've got a long history of working on uh, breast and colon cancer and the majority of the work in the division is, is based around these two tumour types, although we do also work on a number of others, including glioblastoma and haematological malignancies, and more recently, cholangiocarcinoma, pancreatic cancer, and head and neck cancer. Uh, we also do an awful lot of work in normal stem cells and the utilisation of these for clinical technologies. Uh, with regards to the themes of the work, the majority of the work that we do in the division is tumour microenvironment, uh, in particular my research around hypoxia and a number of the other groups looking at the, the role of tumour microenvironment stromal cells. Uh, we do a lot of molecular pathology, uh, we have a, a number of tumour immunology groups uh, and a, a groups developing preclinical pre models. Uh, investigating cancer stem cells, uh, radiation and vascular biology. Uh, we have a number of uh, collaborators both inside the UK but as Nigel said the other day we're a very outward looking university and we have a significant number of collaborations from abroad and I, I've put some of the, the ones in which some of the countries in which we have the majority of our collaborations on the right hand side. Uh, we don't currently have any uh, collaborations in Russia at the moment but I'm hoping uh, through the discussions after my talk today that we can develop some good collaborations going forward, if not directly with my work, then with some of the other researchers within the division. Uh, so I'm now going to talk uh, about some of the work that we've been doing on targeting the tumour uh, hypoxic microenvironment. Uh, and this is an immunohistochemistry picture of a tumour that's been stained with a marker for hypoxia, pymonidazole in brown and you can see just how big a part this plays in some of the tumours uh, that's, that's generally overlooked in some of the, uh, the studies. Uh, so what is hypoxia? Uh, so hypoxia is found in about 30 to 50 percent of solid tumours and this really depends on the tumour and tumour subtype and this induces significant molecular adaptations which uh, affect the molecular characteristics of the tumours and impact the therapy resistance, chemotherapy, molecular targeted therapy and radiotherapy. Uh, it also increases invasion and metastasis and is associated therefore with worse patient outcome. Uh, this hypoxia arises due to the high proliferation uh, and high metabolic rate of tumours and aberrant tumour vascularisation. And you can see in the figure on the left hand side, tumours that are distal to a functional blood vessel, so oxygen has a diffusion distance of about 80 to 100 micro, micrometers in tumours, uh, tend to be hypoxic. It's important to note that as well as the hypoxia, these are areas also experience decreased cell nutrients and increased cell waste products, and in particular uh, quite a lot of the work that I have done is focused on uh, acidity. Uh, tumour hypoxia can be identified in patients using imaging, such as 18F MISO-PET, uh, by immunohistochemical analysis for markers of hypoxia, such as HIF or CA9. <coughs> it can be uh, identified in patients from transcriptomic analysis using gene expression signatures or using oxygen electrodes on, on the actual tumours themselves. 
So uh, hypoxia induces this molecular adaptation through the HIF proteins, uh, which Lorraine uh, talked about yesterday, and HIF1-alpha is the, the major driver of her model of the clear cell renal cell carcinoma. Uh, in normoxia, uh, these proteins are hydroxylated by the prolyl hydroxylases, which require oxygen as a cofactor, and this leads to VHL binding in ubiquitination and proteasomal degradation. In hypoxia, where oxygen is, um, there's not enough oxygen, uh, this doesn't happen. HIF translocates to the nucleus and uh, binds with the HIF-1 beta and induces the expression of a number of downstream target genes. And these regulate the major hallmarks of cancer, including proliferation and survival, metabolism, pH regulation, angiogenesis, and invasion and metastasis. So the work in my lab really focuses on understanding and trying to inhibit this molecular adaptation that occurs in hypoxia to try and identify new ways of inhibiting this that could be used to treat these therapy-resistant regions in combination with other uh, therapeutics. So I'm going to talk, uh, give an, a brief overview of one of the, um, of an example of one of the projects that we do in the lab and then uh, just on a single slide, show a couple of other examples, uh, projects that we would, be, we would welcome collaborations on. And I'm going to finish off by just talking briefly about the Nottingham Cancer Centre, which Nigel uh, mentioned briefly at the end of uh, his talk on the first day. So this project really started off um, following on from a Windows of Opportunity trial that had, was being carried out by some of our collaborators. And these Windows of Opportunity trials work by um, utilizing the window between when a patient is diagnosed and when the tumor is, the primary tumor is resected to treat with a uh, therapeutic to then try and understand what the molecular impact of that was on the tumors. Uh, and in this case, the, the, uh, the, the clinician was particularly interested in what the impact was of antiangiogenic therapy, bevacizumab, on breast cancer to try and understand why uh, this therapy hadn't been as clinically impactful as had been hoped. And the way the study was uh, set up was that the patients were diagnosed and then enrolled onto the, uh, the trial uh, treated with bevacizumab for two weeks and at the end of the trial the tumour was excised and profiled molecularly by a number of techniques and I'm just showing a kind of schematic of the RNA-seq data that was, was carried out, the transcriptomics analysis. Uh, they also did dynamic contrast-enhanced MRI to look at perfusion uh, in the tumours to see whether or not the anti-angiogenic therapy was affecting the perfusion of the tumours and you can see those results for the pre- um, uh, the, the pre-treatment and the post-treatment. And the tumours really fell into uh, uh, three categories. Uh, those for which the anti-angiogenic therapy <coughs> had very little or no effect on perfusion within the tumour. Uh, those for which the anti-angiogenic therapy had an impact on the, the perfusion and this led to large central necrosis of the tumour and those for which there was uh, a reduction in perfusion, but actually the tumour the tumor mass didn't uh, change at all. And it was those patients in particular that we were interested in uh, from the molecular profiling. And when we went through the uh, RNA-seq data, of course, we saw a, an upregulation of a number of the hypoxia-regulated genes. And as my major interest is in uh, carbonic an was at the time in carbonic anhydrase 9, we had identified this was upregulated. So we did a number of studies, um, and I'm showing the example actually of some unpublished data that we did from this study, uh, looking at inhibiting or knocking down the carbonic anhydrase 9 and combining that with antiangiogenic therapy in uh, breast, colon, and uh, glioblastoma cancer cell lines and growing them as xenografts. And you can see here from the data that knockdown of CA9 reduces xenograft growth rate as we'd seen previously compared to controls here on the left. The anti-angiogenic therapy in red also reduces xenograft growth rate, but when you combine them together, you get a much more significant effect. So what does the carbonic anhydrase 9 do? Uh, carbonic anhydrase 9 has been shown to regulate both the intracellular and extracellular pH in uh, tumors. And it does this by extracellularly hydrating carbon, uh, 
CO2 to form hydrogen, iron and bicarbonate. So uh, we and others have hypothesized that this bicarbonate could be being taken back up into the tumor uh, and where it could be used to titrate intracellular hydrogen ions produced from metabolic processes um, and turned into CO2 in a uh, reaction catalyzed by intracellular carbonic anhydrases such as CA2. The CO2 can then diffuse across the membrane and you get cycling of the hydrogen ions outside of the cell. So we went back to the, the, the data and looked to see if there was any changes in any of these bicarbonate transporters and in fact there was a number of them were changed. So we investigated their expression in a panel of cell lines including uh, colon cancer, glioblastoma, uh, breast cancer. This panel has been extended to a, a larger number and also a small number of head and neck cancers. And in all but one of these tumor cell lines, we've seen a regulation of at least one bicarbonate transporter in response to hypoxia. Um, the major ones that were regulated most frequently and most highly were the SLC4A4, 4A5, and SLC4A9, and the majority of our downstream work has focused on these. So we made uh, knockdowns of these of these proteins in colon cancer, uh, breast cancer, and glioblastoma, and had a look at the impact of this on 3D spheroid growth. So we use the 3D spheroids as a model in this because, uh, like the tumors, they establish the, uh, the oxygen gradients, but also the pH and nutrient gradients that we see in tumors. Uh, and when we investigated the effect of knockdown compared to the controls in black uh, in the colon, breast, and glioblastoma cell lines, we saw a significant reduction in spheroid growth. Uh, there's also an inhibitor of the bicarbonate transporters, S0859, and we had a look to see whether or not inhibition of the bicarbonate transporters had a similar effect. Uh, so the untreated are in black and the treated are in red, and you can see the inhibition of the bicarbonate transporters significantly reduced spheroid growth rate as well. Uh, in the glioblastoma, we combine this with, oh, so that's on, yeah, in the glioblastoma, we combined this with a CA9 knockdown and saw that the bicarbonate transport inhibition um, had the similar effect as the CA9 knockdown, and when you combine them together, we see an additive effect. Uh, the result that we saw in the MDA and B231s was particularly interesting because once we'd been treating for a certain amount of time, the spheroids actually just popped because of the large central necrosis that was developing, and I'll show a picture of that in a few slides. So we wanted to check to see whether or not the uh, bicarbonate transporters were in fact regulating the intracellular pH as we had uh, proposed. So again, we used the spheroid model. We used the dual, of, dual emission fluoroprobe, uh, carboxysnarf one to measure the intracellular pH of the cells in these spheroids and confocal microscopy to look through the core of the spheroid. Uh, we measured the pH from the uh, in concentric circles from the periphery of the spheroid to the core, uh, shown here, periphery to the core, and then on the, the graph on the, the right, periphery to the core, uh, and compared the controls against the um, knockdowns and also the inhibition, and we saw a, a significant reduction in the uh, intracellular pH in response to both the knockdowns and the inhibition. Uh, so what impact did this have on the, the spheroids? We uh, did some uh, fixing. We fixed the spheroids, uh, sectioned them and stained them for a number of immunohistochemical markers. And I'm just showing here the cleave caspase free as a marker of apoptosis. And when we knock down the bicarbonate transporters or use the inhibitor, we see a significant upregulation in the amount of apoptosis occurring in the core of these spheroids. And you can see here we've started to develop a necrotic core in response to this. Uh, we took these forward and have grown them as xenografts, uh, and you can see uh, the controls in black compared to the knockdowns in red. We see a significant uh, delay in tumor growth. Uh, so we're taking this forward at the moment and trying to develop um, hypoxia prodrug versions of the bicarbonate transport inhibitor that could be used to target the uh, hypoxic tumors in particular. Um, we're also developing the project in a number of other ways. 
Uh, so I have a, a very talented PhD student who at the moment is investigating the role of these bicarbonate transporters in uh, invasion and uh, migration in the hope of taking these forward into um, metastatic assays in vivo. Uh, when we knock down or inhibit the bicarbonate transporters, we see a reduction in both um, migration and invasion through matrigel. And he started to pull apart the mechanism by which this is occurring. And we see changes in uh, EMT genes, significant reduction in phosphosignaling. In particular, we've seen downregulation of both mTOR and phospho-AMPK signaling. And we've just now started to do some basic metabolic assays to see whether or not it's worth doing metabolic profiling of these. Um, and we see reduction in ATP, extracellular lactate, and mitochondrial uh, copy number. Uh, which we're also investigating by electron, um, electro EM. Yeah. Uh, we're also just about to take this in, in vivo using uh, some of the great uh, preclinical metastatic models of breast cancer that we've developed within the division. Um, I'm now just going to talk briefly about two other projects that we have ongoing in the lab, one on BET inhibitors and, and then one following on from that, uh, which I think would be uh, good opportunities for possible collaborations. So the work that we did on the BET inhibitors really came out of a uh, drug screen that we did, trying to identify whether or not we could epigenetically target the molecular adaptation driven by HIF in hypoxic tumours uh, as a way of clinically targeting uh, these, these therapy resistant regions. Uh, so we used a drug panel of 109 clinically relevant epigenetic inhibitors uh, in normoxia and hypoxia, looking at survival and also the impact on gene expression, hypoxia regulated gene expression, and identified three different groups which had an impact on uh, hypoxic gene expression and hypoxic survival, one of which was the uh, BET proteins, and we focused on this because there's a significant number of clinical trials in the BET proteins at the moment. <clears throat> uh, but nobody had previously identified any impact in hypoxia. Uh, so we felt this was really worth following up. Uh, the BET proteins associate with um, many transcription factors, uh, but most of the previous work has focused on their regulation of MYC proteins. Um, the BET proteins, when we talk about the BET proteins, I mean BRD2 to 4 and BRDT. And these regulate transcription by reading acetylated lysines. If you remember Nigel's talk yesterday, he showed very eloquently the, the different epigenetic changes that can occur on histones and how they can be read and how that can affect transcription. The BET proteins read uh, lysine acetylation and then recruit other transcription factors and epigenetic regulators. So I'm just going to give a brief overview of some of the work. We did some transcriptomic analysis, and we identified that for about a third of the hypoxia-regulated genes, there was little or no effect of the BED inhibitors. About a third of them actually increased, but a third of them were decreased, and we followed up on these. Uh, and in particular, JQ1, the BET inhibitor that we did the majority of the work on, significantly inhibited upregulation of the hypoxic gene signature and genes associated with angiogenesis and the pentose phosphate pathway. And we'd previously shown the importance of the pentose phosphate pathway in hypoxia by preventing ROS induced senescence, that, as it prevents ROS induced senescence. So I'm skipping, over, skipping through quite a lot of the work, but what we actually showed was that the BET protein was actually required for recruitment of HIF2, the promoters of some of these uh, hypoxia regulated genes. And we see here we do uh, CHIP, so chromatin immunoprecipitation for HIF binding to the promoter of carbonic anhydrase 9. When we uh, put cells in hypoxia, we see an increase in the amount of HIF binding compared to controls. When we treat with JQ1, we see a significant decrease. Uh, we grew the cells, the, uh, some breast cancer xenografts and had a look at the impact of JQ1 on these. And we see a reduction in, in tumor growth rate as had been seen before, but we also see a significant reduction in the amount of angiogenesis within these tumors, and they're very poorly vascularized. Uh, so we're taking this forward at the moment, trying to understand which of these BET proteins is most important by doing individual knockdowns and knockouts, uh, and to understand whether or not 
uh, targeting one of these in particular would give a greater would have a greater impact than targeting them all together. And the preliminary data suggests that that is in fact the case for the BRD4 and the BRD2. When we target those individually, we see a greater impact. Uh, the other work that I, I just wanted to touch briefly on also came out of a different genetic-based screen uh, where we used um, uh, an shRNA-based knockdown of 6,000 different genes and had a look at the impact on the, uh, the growth in normoxia and hypoxia of colon cancer cells, uh, both in 2D, also in 3D, and also with xenografts with and without anti-angiogenic therapy to try and identify uh, novel ways of targeting these regions. Um, we identified a significant uh, a, a number of targets which were following up on in the lab, but I just wanted to show some of the data from uh, one of those targets which we've expanded out. We actually identified FOSL2, which is a subunit of the AP1 transcription factor. Um, so we investigated whether or not, uh, so FOSL2 is a subunit of the AP1 transcription factor and this heterodimerizes with other subunits of AP1, uh, including the germ proteins. Uh, and we've been investigating the expression of these proteins in normoxia and hypoxia and see an increased expression at the protein level of a number of these AP1 subunits. Uh, we've been doing some clonogenic assays in the, in the colon cancer cell lines in normoxia in red and hypoxia in blue. And uh, for FOSL2 in particular, we see no effect in normoxia, but a significant reduction in, of survival in hypoxia. Uh, we've also identified that high expression of the FOSL2 is associated with worse patient outcome in colon cancer. Uh, we've been extending this study out and I'm showing some data at the bottom which combines a couple of the different studies we have going on in the lab looking at different transcriptional regulation of hypoxia regulated genes and I'm showing the data we've pulled together for the carbonic anhydrase 9. So CA9 is the archetypal uh, HIF regulated protein but when we knock down a number of other transcription factors which uh, who, that have transcription factor binding sites in the promoter region of the, HIF, of the CA9 we also see significant reductions in the induction in hypoxia, suggesting a, a more complex uh, transcriptional regulation, which we're now starting to try and unpick. So I just want to finish by talking briefly about the University of Nottingham Cancer, the, the cancer centre that has been developed. <clears throat> and this will uh, open uh, at about this time next year. Uh, and this will provide integrated laboratories for a number of the, the key research themes that we have in Nottingham, particularly uh, breast cancer research for which we have a, the long history, also the uh, Children's Brain Tumor Research Centre. Uh, we will ha also have focuses on the similar, um, the similar strategies that we have within the division. Uh, and um, the main idea of this is to bring together uh, the majority of the cancer research that's going on in Nottingham, uh, both the basic researchers and also the clinical scientists, the clinical researchers, to try and really push forward cancer research in Nottingham. Uh, so, as well as investing in the buildings and bringing the clinic, the academics together, the university is also investing in uh, new academic positions to fill additional roles, which we feel would help us. Uh, push really begin to push forward cancer research in Nottingham. Uh, so we actually had 11 new positions uh, to fill and we've filled two of those already and are, are looking to fill an additional nine. <clears throat> so in addition to investing in the building and bringing the cancer research together in Nottingham, the University and the NHS Trust are also interested in developing the uh, clinical trials uh, uh, capabilities of uh, cancer research in Nottingham and some of the areas that we're vacating within the hospital are being refurbished, refurbished uh, to provide additional space for phase one and phase two clinical trials. And the clinical trials head, uh, Madhu, who's actually a member of my division, uh, working together, we really are hoping to really push forward some more of these windows of opportunities trials to really start to translate some of the basic research that we're doing into the clinic. 
Uh, so I'd like to finish by uh, acknowledging the work, the majority of the work that I've shown here was done by uh, my lab, the three PhD students, Hannah, Chris and Huda, uh, the postdocs, Eric and Leo. So um, as Nigel said, we like the internationalization aspect uh, and three of them, lem members of my lab are from abroad, Huda from uh, Pakistan, Eric from France and Leo from Brazil. And that is a real, it makes it a really exciting environment to work in. Uh, my collaborators in Oxford, uh, Adrian Harris and Daniel Ebner, uh, and collaborators from Nottingham, uh, Stuart and Anna, and uh, collaborators from uh, other areas in the world, in Brazil, uh, Germany and France. Uh, and I'd also like to thank our uh, funders, our generous funders, Breast Cancer Now, the MRC and Bowel and Cancer Research, who funded most of the most recent work, NCR UK who funded the uh, initial uh, screening and thank you for listening. For the MIC? For um, BET MIC. Well, and my next question is do you think with HIF 1A it's the, it's the same mechanism? So actually, we don't, we don't see degradation of HIF with the BET treatment. So it, I, it, I don't think it's exactly the same mechanism. It is stopping the HIF from binding to the promoter region of these genes, and we're trying to investigate in exactly what context and the timings of that at the moment. The work that we did actually was done in cell lines that had the breast cancer cell lines that have MIC amplification and are MIC driven, and those that actually have loss of uh, MIC uh, at the DNA and protein level. Uh, so it's not the effects that we're seeing aren't essentially MIC driven with the HIF. Um, I don't think the, the MIC mechanism is universal across some of the other transcription factors that it regulates. And I'm not sure that, for instance, twist is another transcription factor that was recently shown to be regulated by the BET proteins in breast cancer. I can't remember, but I don't think that was, was also degraded in response to the BET proteins. studies on the CA9 knockdown, you had uh, a picture of momentum and snail mm. reduced. Uh, do you know anything more about the mechanism there? Is it, <coughs> a, is it a transcriptional mechanism? Or? I wasn't sure if that was a Western or if that was a... So that was Weston's. Um, it's thought. with the bicarbonate transporters. Uh, we're not. We're not entirely sure on the mechanism for that. It had been previously published uh, impact as an impact on um, with CA9. So previously published that CA9 has affects uh, migration and invasion and also affects EMT. And we had also previously shown that for CA9. We're trying to unpick the mechanism for that at the moment. Uh, by looking at the impact on phosphosignaling. So uh, I also showed that the, if you inhibit the bicarbonate transporters or knock them down, we specifically downregulate quite a lot of the phosphosignaling. Um, the mechanism for that and how that might lead to EMT, so uh, the mechanism for the downregulation of the, the phosphosignaling is, probably comes in two different ways. So. Uh, the acidity is affecting calcium signaling, which will affect quite a lot of the downstream phosphosignaling. Also, certain members of the phosphosignaling, such as the mTOR, have been previously shown to be um, impacted by acidity. So they have acid-sensing uh, members. mTOR's got, uh, I think it's Raptor or Richter, which actually won't bind to mTOR1 or mTOR2 in acidity. Um, because it changes the conformation of the protein. And uh, how do you generate hypoxic condition in your experiments? Or you just study spheroids and uh, the hypoxia in the core of the spheroids? Yeah. 
So the, the majority of the work we like to use multiple models. So we use the spheroids because they're a particularly good model and quite a lot of the work I didn't go into it in, in the talk, quite a lot of the work that we've done in the pH regulation, we don't actually see any effect in 2D culture. Uh, we really need to have those gradients established in, in, uh, in 3D. So basically uh, you're working on the normal condition in which? We're working on the... Oh, so for the spheroids, we're working under normoxic conditions, but we also have a hypoxic. We also have a hypoxic chamber, so where we can a hypoxic workstation, uh, similar but not as quite as good as yours, and we don't have a fluorescent microscope in it. So that I think there's plenty of, we've got plenty of studies for which that would be particularly useful, um, but we have a, the similar setup with the hypoxic workstation where we can do work inside it, change the media, uh, do whole experiments in. That. I'd like to rephrase my question. Okay. So, uh, Is it in six parts? <laughs> <laughs> if you see in cancer uh, cell, uh, in cancer meat activity, do you think that all this can be inhibited by the Okay, I, I, I don't feel like I could actually answer that question. We haven't focused on the role of BET in MIC. Most of the, the literature has focused on the role of BET. Um, in regulation of NIC, uh, but that's not been the main focus of the research that we do. So uh, we we are planning to do that, uh, so we um, we have uh, I've forgotten the name of the system that Anna's got. So we have an I yeah we have an IVIS. So um, we and we have, we will label the tumours with a GFP or a, a, a turbo RFP a HIF response element, so we can look at whether or not HIF is expressed, whether or not um, those regions within the tumour and how much of those regions are. Hypoxic, and at the moment, I know that Anna's been the one of the um, other professors in the division has been developing this technology and has been trialing it in a number of different tumor types. to be here and to have this presentation. I'm still having all the date, but I uh, had to move my presentation. And I think it was a, a good thing because I will try to go through some posters which will be presented in a coffee break room during coffee break. So please, if you will find some uh, of our projects <coughs> interesting, just write down the poster number and you can go and uh, look at posters and find much more details there. Um, Cancer control in Russia. That is a prob probably the main question we all have here. Uh, do we have a good cancer control or not? And how we can, uh, um, uh, what we can do to make it better? Uh, in <clears throat> a few years ago, there was a number of papers indicating the problems of cancer diagnosis and treatment uh, in uh, in. Uh, few countries, and among them three countries like Russia, India, and China, uh, were taken as uh, critical countries in cancer control. Uh, so <coughs> we have about 40% of population, 46% of newly diagnosed cancer cases, 
and 52% of all cancer mortality. Uh, that really indicates we have some problems with uh, diagnosis and with statistics. So when I came back from Sweden in 2014, I've been trying very hard to find a good uh, cancer statistics of Russia. Uh, like at that moment, we had a global kind of web page with uh, statistics of 2012. Uh, but uh, I was interested in Russian statistics. I couldn't find it until recently. So we do have good statistics where we can find uh, incidence and mortality for each type of cancer, uh, for uh, each uh, stage of diagnosis and each region of, of Russia. If you'll be interested in that, I can send a document. Unfortunately, it's only in Russia. There is no translation and probably never will be one. Uh, but it's quite easy to understand numbers. Uh, I will um, go through some cancer types which is interested to audience here. Like, say no, most of you are working with prostate, breast cancer, kidney cancer, and, and neck cancer. Uh, if we compare three countries, we say UK <coughs> and Russia. So, you have total population here, you have percentage of living with cancer, and you have risk of dying from cancer. Uh, as you see, risk of dying from cancer in Russia is almost twice higher than in the USA. But uh, percentage is quite small. I can try to explain why. Uh, four years ago, when I came back, the total number, according to official documents, was about 2.05 million people living with cancer. Now it's 3.6 million people living with cancer in four years. Of course, we didn't get uh, additional 1.2 million uh, uh, patients, uh, but uh, diagnosis is changing slightly. So there is a national program now uh, started in cancer care, and we're really hoping uh, these numbers will uh, will change and will will be able to understand why. Uh, risk of dying from cancer is so high, and what can we do about that? Uh, <coughs> now, what about Tatarstan? Uh, <coughs> almost 55% of cancers in uh, Russia diagnosed on stages 1 and 2. Uh, we have about 40% uh, uh, on stage 3 and 4, and 5% unknown uh, in Tatarstan. Uh, slightly better statistics for early stages, but you've heard about it yesterday during our visit to Cancer Center. Uh, number of uh, patients dying during first year after diagnosis is still very high. We have 26% of patients who is not surviving first year, and first year survival is only 53%. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, in the state it's almost 70 now. Mm. We've been here yesterday. I hope you enjoyed the excursion. Uh, but uh, the models using different cell lines, trying to study fundamental mechanisms, and groups working together with a clinical cancer center and having patient-related projects. I listed uh, open lab uh, names and uh, professors who is leading the projects. Like among them, I can see Professor Mzia Kiamova in the audience. Uh, of course, Albert is here. Uh, so, Professor Kiamova is leading the uh, biomarker open lab, and they are working on the identification of new target uh, of new uh, biomarkers for uh, cancer diagnosis using high throughput technologies like CRISPR Cas uh, library screening and NGS. Uh, you've seen yesterday presentation from Oleg Gusev's lab, that was Lena giving a talk about mutations in uh, Tatar population. Uh, and of course, Albert is uh, having a lot of different projects, uh, which can be divided to two probably uh, main groups. So one is uh, cellular cancer biology and uh, uh, diagnosis, and second is uh, gene therapy in cancer. Uh, We'll go through. So you, you see poster numbers here. You can go and look later. 
Uh, today I want to give you a short overview of projects which uh, is done in uh, by my team. Uh, so, this is Almas. was first uh, PhD student who en entered the group when I came. Uh, unfortunately, he couldn't attend conference because recently he got two internships and uh, he's planning to spend next nine months in Portugal and Sweden. But <clears throat> Uh, in 2015, there was a paper indicating what antibiotics uh, used in a clinic can affect the number of uh, cancer stem cells. Like for a long time, it's been known what uh, simultaneous treatment of cancer patients with chemotherapy and antibiotics uh, can affect the patient's survival. But mechanism of that action were uh, never investigated. So the, uh, this was the first paper showing what uh, antibiotics are affecting cancer stem cells. And we decided to check two uh, different things. First, how hy hypoxia is affecting that. Um, and uh, uh, this graph is indicating what actually uh, short-term hypoxia is not affecting uh, cancer stem cells. Uh, using ILDH uh, high labeling, you can, uh, we have shown on breast cancer model what uh, stem cell number is not uh, uh, changing after 48 hours of, of incubation in hypoxia. But if we go for long-term hypoxia, we've done uh, one to two weeks uh, treatment, uh, stem cell number is actually decreasing a lot. Uh, second, it was how antibiotics are affecting uh, cell survival, and uh, we took a model of mammospheres, uh, and uh, actually found what azithromycin, which was efficient in narmoxia in, in a paper from 2015 and was efficient in our experiments, is not working in uh, hypoxia. So we also found some changes in uh, ILDH high cell number after hypoxia treatment. You can find the results in an uh, abstract on the page 6 uh, also on a poster. Uh, and now Almas uh, went to, I mean, planning to go to Sweden to actually investigate the role of uh, mitochondrial biogenesis in uh, inhibition of cancer stem cells in hypoxia. Second project, uh, Dina just entered PhD program in, in our lab and uh, she's working on circulating tumor cells in ovarian cancer. Uh, so that project is done in collaboration with our cancer center and uh, with uh, Ulyanovsk State University, uh, who is sending us uh, samples from uh, Ulyanovsk. Uh, the main idea was to see if uh, we can correlate uh, circulating tumor cell number by uh, with clinical parameters, and uh, we can correlate the number with treatment efficacy. So this is a long-term project started just six months ago. Uh, now we have. Uh, about 50 patients who started their treatment uh, and <clears throat> planning to check the uh, circulating tumor cell number during entire course of treatment and follow up patients for a few years afterwards. But what we see now, there is no correlation between CTC number and clinical uh, biomarkers like CA125. Uh, uh, in the beginning of treatment, it's been uh, two courses, like uh, two to four months of treatment. We see a uh, decrease in number of circulating tumor cells in most of the patients. Of course, we have few patients which show an increase in number and uh, doctors are actually working with that cases now and trying to in in investigate uh, if uh, therapy needs to be changed. So, uh, hoping to present you long follow-up data during our next year conference. Uh, Rima uh, is working with uh, gene modification of different cell lines. The main idea was what we need to uh, uh, have a local biobank of various cell lines. So we started with immortalization of normal cells and rare cell types. Once we, you can't buy at ATCC or any cell biobank. So we have successfully immortalized few cell types and we went to uh, experiments with uh, 
increasing uh, stem cell number in a cell line. So uh, we took OCT4, SOX2, KLF, CNIC, NANOC, and checked how overexpression of uh, these genes are affecting uh, mammosphere number. Uh, now we are using combination of the genes and actually have cell lines which uh, has an increase in uh, stem cell number by uh, four to eight folds. Uh, and also, this is an example how um, collaborations and traveling uh, are good for us. Like last year, we visited Nottingham and there was a discussion about uh, hemoglobin genes uh, and uh, their role in um, regulation of cancer stem cells and uh, cancer mitochondria. So now uh, Rimba is working on hemoglobin A and B uh, uh, knockouts uh, using CRISPR-Cas9. Hopefully we'll know uh, about our success rate during this month because uh, we have few clones and uh, doing sequencing at the moment. Uh, Agul, uh, she's been in the lab for a few years but uh, just joined PhD program in September. Uh, she is working on uh, tumor stroma interaction. Uh, so, using our immortalized mesenchymal stem cells, now we've been able to create so called chimeric spheres. Uh, we took prostate cancer PC3 cells uh, overexpressing blue fluorescent protein, uh, immortalized mesenchymal stem cells overexpressing green fluorescent protein, and uh, tried to use different. Uh, medias to culture spheres out of mesenchymal stem cells. We were actually lucky to, uh, to, got, uh, to get spheres which uh, have mesenchymal stem cells in the core and uh, prostate uh, cells surrounding. Uh, this model is now used in many experiments. The first experiment, we, uh, we've tried to identify if uh, mesenchymal stem cells play any role in uh, treatment resistance. Uh, this, uh, so <coughs> you can see what, uh, for example, tepid can treatment uh, can effectively reduce the number of uh, prostate cancer uh, spheres, uh, but not affecting that much chimeric spheres. Uh, now we are doing profiling. Uh, using RNA sequencing and uh, uh, different uh, immune profiling, uh, you can find sorry, results uh, in our abstract on page 29 and also in, in a poster number 29. Uh, she is a second year uh, PhD student uh, in our lab and she is working on non uh, long encoding RNAs as potential biomarkers for cervical cancer. Uh, she spent one year uh, collecting biobank. Now we have uh, more than 150 uh, samples from patients with cervical cancer and uh, cervical intraepithelial uh, neoplasia uh, at uh, different stages. So the main idea is to find uh, sensitive biomarkers to predict if uh, since will uh, go, uh, will transform to cervical cancer. And uh, we are using two different sample types, that is a serum and uh, cervical leverage, and trying to identify markers which will be uh, more sensitive prognostic uh, markers than uh, cervical biopsy, because biopsy is uh, made nowadays on uh, quite high number of, of patients and of course uh, that always uh, correlates with, uh, brings some risks uh, starting uh, with bleeding and uh, basically uh, finishing with uh, effect on um, child giving, birth giving. Uh, Masha, uh, she is in UTL lab, she just started her uh, master program and joint lab 
few months ago, but she was very successful and she started to work with uh, Progastrin as a uh, new plasma biomarker for cancer diagnosis. There is a company in France who is uh, proposing Progastrin as new biomarker, which can be used for all kinds of cancer and for especially for early detection. So we've done studies with uh, ovarian cancer and with colorectal cancer, and now uh, we came up with a, a kit which, uh, which can be used in a clinic for diagnosis of uh, colorectal cancer. Uh, the Marsha's project was to look into uh, non-cancer diseases and see what is the uh, sensitivity uh, of the method and specificity. As you see here, we went for some of uh, our autoimmune disorders like Crohn's disease, uh, thyroiditis, and rheumatoid arthritis, and found what, uh, for example, rheumatoid arthritis has quite high rate of uh, positive uh, plasma samples. Uh, I mean, she started just a few months ago. We will try to come up with good statistics, um, but. Uh, you can find more information on uh, uh, page 50 and poster number 50. Yulia uh, uh, is, work, is working on circulating tumor cells as hematopathy sensitivity markers. She is our uh, PhD student as well. Uh, the main idea was to use uh, liquid biopsy as prognostic marker for uh, hemosensitivity and we can see how uh, sensitivity of the cells to different therapies uh, and especially we can use our station to check sensitivity in nervoxia and hypoxia. Uh, as you see here, almost with all uh, compounds, this was a renal cancer model, uh, we, we used a uh, <coughs> uh, compound efficacy was, uh, uh, was much lower in hypoxic environment. Uh, and especially if you look at docetaxel, uh, we often see a clamp of uh, proliferating cells in hypoxia, whereas in anoxia there is a still inhibition uh, as compared to control samples, which uh, really leads us uh, to the idea what uh, most of the cancer studies need to be uh, transferred to hypoxic environment, especially in pharmacology. Uh, continuing our story with antibiotics, we have treated circulating tumor cells with different types of antibiotics and uh, seeing quite good inhibition uh, rate, not only in normoxia, but also uh, in, in hypoxia. And this process is really uh, uh, specific for each patient. We've done you now some patients with uh, breast cancer and uh, see uh, sensitivity to different drugs and to different antibiotics and their com combination in breast cancer as well. Uh, and uh, Albert's group is huge, so he is working in many different areas. And uh, here, here is just a part of his group. So this is a cellular and molecular and, uh, oncology team uh, together with uh, uh, PI of uh, chemical biology and some students from chemical biology and uh, some free time we are having outside of the lab. And this is our collaborators. So we are very thankful to uh, Yeni Person, uh, Professor Nigel Longan and Svetlana Haibullina for their help with all our projects and uh, always happy to see them here in Tatarstan and have a great time with them. And a special thanks to our colleagues from Oncology Center, uh, I see Dr. Albert Kimranov and uh, Afia Hasanova who is here, who is helping with uh, many projects in uh, um, breast cancer and uh, almost all types of cancer now. <laughs> So, thank you very much. Ready for your questions. Thank you, Rina. Uh, questions for Rina? Uh, so, my question is, what does it mean for you, to be, uh, for the program to be a biomarker for cancer? I'll give you the, so the context of why I'm asking. If you take any well-studied cancer, Yes. 
expanded, and you get hundreds of projects reported in the literature that are either all expressed or down regulated, maybe even some. So, uh, obviously, it's not enough for you. So, you, you're going after either pro gastric or non coding RNA, in particular. Why? Uh, I think the biggest problem of uh, all samples we can find in open databases and analyze using Pathway Studio, for example, is lack of full information about patients' staging. Uh, like we are looking for very early uh, diagnostic markers, which means what we need to collect uh, patient samples, which uh, uh, from patients on first stage and pre-cancer. Uh, stages uh, uh, kind of it's possible with cervical cancer that's why we're using it as a model uh, it's possible with colorectal cancer if we take some diseases associated with colorectal cancer for example uh, but it's uh, almost not possible with uh, most of the cancer types like if you take breast cancer what is pre-cancer stage how you can identify it and uh, all biomarkers which you can find in Pathway Studio using open available uh, samples, that is biomarkers uh, for cancer patients mostly on uh, late stages, third, fourth. Uh, we're trying to uh, uh, get a better system for, for cancer screening. And, is, uh, is, is that an answer or you meant something else? Yeah, yeah uh, so just maybe another question is uh, given that we're talking about the precision of personalized medicine yes. Yes, uh, obviously each cancer is unique so you would expect that uh, biomarkers even in early stage biomarkers can, will be different for different patients uh, so yeah, that's, that's, them, that's actually stage. true I mean, uh, like I mentioned long non-coding RNA project so we're, we're trying to come up not with one biomarker but with profile of biomarkers, like uh, we took all known non codings for cervical cancer, for example, and ovarian cancer, uh, and trying to see what pattern will correspond to different stages of cancer and what pattern will correspond to pre-cancer uh, conditions. Biomarker pattern? Yes. It's like we have 10 uh, markers, uh, five will go up, five will go down, yes. Question or suggestions, why? Go after just one problem instead of just panel. Uh, maybe that's the future, but uh, uh, for clinics it is much cheaper and easier to work with one specific biomarker. And since we are working with our cancer center, we also try to uh, follow their interests. But as a biomarker can be only good for 10% of the patients. Yeah, I'm not a grief. Some biomarkers are quite efficient on 50-60% of uh, patients. Of course, it's it's never hungry. Yes. How do you think single cell genomics might help address uh, Anton's point about the heterogeneity of CTCs? Yes. Uh, thank you very much. That's a wonderful question. So we recently done single cell sequencing of some patient. Uh, samples with uh, breast, ovarian cancer and uh, uh, renal cancer. So we see huge heterogeneity in uh, circulating tumor cell patterns. So now it's a time to, for, for you, for bioinformaticians, uh, to, to help us with the analysis. And uh, if we can find the markers which can differentiate different subgroups of circulating tumor cells in, indicate which one is the most dangerous one uh, and uh, what combination of biomarkers can be used for identification. Of course, that will be I mean, a perfect idea just uh, for testing and for, for future projects. Um, I was uh, very interested in your uh, ZIF model and uh, stem cells, the cancer stem cells. Mm -hmm. um, and that looked more striking in terms of the inhibition both in normoxia and hypoxia than some of the other drugs like erythromycin. Mm -hmm. So do you think that the mechanism, do you know anything, I guess I'm asking, do you know any, do you have any more insight into the mechanism for that? Uh, you know, because if, if it were just protein synthesis inhibition of 
quite a contrary, you might think that erythromycin and azithromycin would work similarly, but they no, they, 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 they work. Y yes. So uh, that's why we now working with uh, mitochondrial biogenesis. Uh, we've seen some differences in, uh, first of all, uh, we've seen some uh, resistance going on with some of the antibiotics. Like uh, we see an increase in uh, ABC transporters uh, after long uh, term culture with antibiotics, some of them. and. Uh, uh, we see a difference in COX-2 expression and the downstreams uh, of that. So, uh, since circulating tumor number was so small, we were not able to identify mechanism yet. But now, uh, when we have a single cell approach, I'm really hoping that will help us to come up with a mechanism during uh, next year, hopefully. <laughs> yes? I have one question for you on the chimera. Yes. Um, do these mesenchymal stem cells remain as stem cells, or do you see differentiation towards like fibroblasts or endothelial cells as you combine them with the cancer cells? Uh -huh. uh, good questions. We haven't checked yet. Uh, I mean, morphology of the cells in the sphere differ a lot from morphology of the uh, cells in 2D culture. Uh, we've done fact sorting and just by uh, expression markers we could confirm it is still mesenchymal stem cells. Uh, and uh, I mean, populations look very clear, uh, the size, uh, the morphology is similar. But that is in control spheres. When we treat spheres with compounds, uh, there is a huge heterogeneity and uh, uh, we have not yet investigated uh, is, if there is a, a differentiation. But what we can say for now, in all controlled spheres we have mesenchymal stem cells in a sphere core. In treated spheres we have mesenchymal stem cells everywhere, so they are mixed up with uh, prostate uh, cancer cells, which means uh, cells start to move and probably uh, it's a crucial mechanism for survival of uh, spheres in the presence of uh, therapy. One more, one more Uh, that really depends on cancer on cancer type. Uh, we have, for example, breast cancer model where stem cell uh, circulating tumor cell number is very low. Uh, we may end up with ten cells, like seven to twenty cells, and we have to work on that amount. We have a variant cancer model where we have thousands of cells actually at uh, stage four patients, and of course that uh, gives us uh, more material for experiments. Uh, we've used also different approaches, uh, like FDA approved system for now is only cell search system, which is based on uh, EPCOM, CD45 and cytokeratins as a markers for sorting. So we use the same antibodies but do fax sorting. Uh, we have our own technique for isolation, which has been de developed, so uh, working on, on that and uh, we also tried to grow uh, spheres uh, out of circulating cells. Uh, not all models give, give off as spheres, most, most of the cells don't grow, but in some cases uh, we can use that as an, an indication of uh, circulating tumor cell number, in that case, in, in samples. A lot of great work. Going on. This is just a teaser, and I hope that you the
So, first of all, I'd like to thank Professor Albert Rizvanoff, um, the organisers and sponsors for this wonderful meeting. It's um, fantastic to be invited. Today I'm actually going to talk about some of the work that arose um, from Nigel Mongan's work with uh, Professor Lorraine um, Goodis, and it's about um, acute uh, kidney injury and clear cell carcinoma. And I rather like to think that Nigel is the mastermind of a giant jigsaw puzzle here, because as you can see by the names, it includes people from um, many people in this room. So it includes, of course, Royal Cornell, and uh, Kazan University, and Nottingham University, and from Sweden. And what I believe he's created is a, a giant jigsaw puzzle of collaborators that are able to input into different parts of the project to show um, two models, one in the pig of acute kidney injury, and um, one in the mouse using Lorraine Gozes's, um track mice, the clear cell kidney cancer mice, and put them together and lead that through into some of the human patient information to make a story, show a story about the um, similarities and the mechanisms behind both of these um, disorders. So kidney cancer is often asymptomatic until metastatic and therefore there is a real need to identify patients with kidney cancer roughly 17,000 cases, for example, per year in America alone. And this could potentially enable curative therapy for localised disease. So this is a rather nice, nice schematic of the models used in this work. And it was drawn by Simone de Brute, who's a phenomenal uh, clinical pathologist. Um, she was at the University of Nottingham and now she's at the University of Bern in Switzerland. But she leads um, this side of the project and is also uh, one of Nigel's PhD students. So um, work has been going on to look at um, both the pig, and the pig is the model for the um, acute kidney injury. By clamping the renal artery, um, ischemic injury is um, produced, and this work is being carried out by David Gardner also at the VET school at the University of Nottingham. And so she's looked at this um, acute kidney injury and compared it um, to Lorraine's track mice with the kidney um, clear cell carcinoma. And what's really interesting about both of these models is that they um, have constitutively activated HIF1 alpha expressed in the kidney. So there are real similarities there. And Nigel asked the question, you know, if they have um, those similarities, do they have similar mechanisms? What are the similarities and differences between them? So the first work um, was really looking for a molecular basis of both of these situations in the models. So first of all, by doing RNA-seq in the pig versus um, control, the pig injury model versus control pigs and also um, by having access to the data from the track mice versus control. And interestingly, there was a network of commonly deregulated genes, and these were also validated by qPCR. And um, these graphs here just show um, some of the um, convergence between the two. And it was interesting that the MYC oncogene um, and also RBP4, retinoic binding protein 4, um, were commonly uh, deregulated between the two. So this was the first hint of a mechanistic similarity between the two models, the model of um, kidney injury and clear cell carcinoma. So we went on to um, undertake some immunohistochemistry and uh, we prioritised um, RBP4 um, but as you can see from the list here, actually, there was quite an interesting list of commonly um, deregulated uh, uh, genes. And so first of all, we started with some hematoxylin and eosin, sorry, from the, these ones shown as from the kidneys of the track mice um, and from the AKI pigs that showed common features of inflammation and fibrosis with evidence, importantly, of tubular regeneration that was absent in the controls. 
So already there were histological similarities between the two. And then when we went on to have a look at the um, immunohistochemistry of, for example, our BP4, um, we can see from the graphs that um, it was increased in both the track mice and in the pig kidneys, the pig um, injury. And Nigel then went on to have a look um, at the Kirk database um, and produced a heat map. Um, this was 200 kidney cancer patients versus control patients, and you can see the kidney cancer at the top and the control patients at the bottom. And so by looking at the mRNA, uh, mRNA level, we could see um, that there were differences between the two groups. So then, after having a look at both the pig and the mouse using immunohistochemistry, um, we went on to have a look at RBP4 expression in the human patients. And um, this was part of a collaboration with Martin Johansson um, from Lund, and he has an extensive um, cohort of 100 patients um, with kidney cancers and has produced TMAs, each containing um, four cores from the patients. And we can see here that the um, clear cell carcinoma um, abundantly expresses the RBP4. So again, a similarity there now between not only the, um, the two animal models, but also the human patients. One of our PhD students um, actually uh, had an internship with a company called NHIS. <coughs> and they're a fairly um, unique company in that they have access to what we call the gold database, which is all of the NHS digital database information. And this PhD student undertook um, initially uh, her work. And so we began discussions with NHIS as to how we could probe the information from the NHS data. The NHS data is a unique resource. Um, it covers around 70 million patient records per year and covers a population of over 50 million people in England. And the majority of patients in England are covered by this NHS database, so it captures a wealth of information, but not many people have access to it. So Chintia and Nigel's PhD student, Ryan, um, went and did an internship with the company in order to actually delve deeper into the patient information. And um, Ryan then looked at um, the kidney cancer incidence in the general population versus the incidence in those um, with a prior kidney injury. And suddenly the project really started coming together. Um, this graph here shows that there was a nearly 90-fold increased cancer risk in the kidney injury population in humans. It's a phenomenal discovery and it really says a lot about um, the link between the two conditions. In addition to that, um, uh, we looked at the time frame or the temporal relationship between kidney injury and um, the kidney cancer. Now, of course, actually, um, quite a few of the um, kidney injury and kidney cancer were discovered um, upon the same admission. If you're looking at the kidney for, for example, kidney injury, you may well find a cancer that has, um, is asymptomatic. Um, but if you then excluded those, um, the patients within two years and up to about five years had an increased risk of having kidney cancer if they had had a prior admission for, um, for kidney injury. And this is um, important because it indicates that what we could do is take patients that have had kidney injury and screen them, ideally for the first five years while they have the increased um, uh, chances of having that cancer. After about five years, the data then normalises to the general population. It was also interesting to note um, that the um, cancer patients with an AKI history 
increased with age. Um, this also reflected the general population um, in relation to the, um, the cancer. And it was also interesting to note that males were more at risk. Um, the, so the males of, uh, with an AKI uh, injury um, were more at risk from getting the kidney cancer. So our data indicates really that um, there's evidence of a mechanistic link between the kidney injury and the kidney cancer that the risk is most significant within two years of initial um, admission with um, acute kidney injury. Males are more at risk. And really, further work is needed in order to investigate follow-up screening of kidney injury patients. And thus, we might be able to provide a curative therapy in contrast to metastatic disease, which is invariably incurable. So this is an example of um, one of the studies that um, is happening um, presently. And, but we have uh, some more examples of studies which are going on at Nottingham, by no means an exhaustive list. But this is using some of our canine models um, to compare canine with human um, cancer. So one of our models is osteosarcoma. So in fact, some breeds of dogs have very high levels of osteosarcoma. And so we've been able to undertake long-term health studies in these dogs and compare those with genomic data in order to um, undertake biomarker discovery. In another project with um, Simone de Bruton and Nigel, um, they've been having a look at um, bladder cancer and also, of course, um, the prostate cancer work we also have a canine model of that, it's a natural model, looking at terrier populations. So they have a 70% increased chance of having um, prostate cancer in comparison with other breeds. Um, and this work will um, involve a collaboration with Brian looking at some of the human prostate cancer. I think this is a perfect example of how um, teamwork, collaborative work um, brings together different skills, different techniques and with so many people that are in this room. And I'm very grateful as well that in the last 14 months these are some of the papers that have come out of um, some of those collaborations um, with, with some of the researchers in this room. So um, Professor um, Rizvanoff um, has been gracious enough to include me on some of the um, VGF, FGF2 horse gene therapy um, trials. Um, we had uh, the most recent paper out last week um, and that follows on from a paper published last year and we were also asked to write an editorial. Um, there was quite a lot of world press in the newspapers, many of the veterinary journals about this technique because it's so in innovative and so exciting. But also, we were enabled to engage um, people that are interested in horse welfare and horse medicine worldwide. So, again, I'd just like to thank all of the people involved in the study. Um, I personally, obviously, um, like to thank Professor Nigel Mong and Professor Lorraine Business as well um, uh, for, you know, for leading the study, Nigel, and for bringing it forward to the place where we are now, where we have a, a brilliant comparison between um, two models and the human data. So thank you very much. One question for you, <laughs> I get away too easily. Um, for the acute kidney injuries that you did with the reviewing of the, the NHS database, the patient assistance there, um, did you have the opportunity to look at any associations with other uh, systemic diseases, so like hypertension, diabetes, things that would be leading to AKI, AKI potentially? Yeah, um, so, sorry, I'll go back to the micro. Um, so, the way that you're in, allowed to interrogate the database, you have to ask very specific questions and it has to go through high levels of approval and ethics from the NHS um, standpoint. Um, really, even asking one question takes an awful long time, it's a nightmare. 
Um, so, how long is long? Sorry? How, how much time we're talking about? Weeks? We're talking several months. Um, it's a long time, it's a long process, and this is working with um, NHIS, who this is their, you know, this is what they do. They are an extremely experienced group. Um, you, you effectively set your questions and have to really think very hard about what questions you want to ask at the beginning. And actually, yeah, we went back, didn't we? Because there was some interesting data that, so if you find some interesting data, you then have to ask another question and the process starts again. It would be phenomenal to be able to ask more questions and we can in the future, of course. Um, but just as yet, we haven't done that. Um, like every other country, we have the red tape. <laughs> um, <laughs> it would so, be so much easier. If there's a real structured database, so this kind of question can be answered within seconds. So, it, what takes them so long? Can you provide some sort of it, 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 it. It's authorization. <laughs> the question can be answered within seconds. You're absolutely, well, not seconds, that's very much undermining the, the work that, that was put in by the team. But um, the, the answer is relatively quick. The authority to ask the question of the database is the slow part. So it's actual approval process. It's the ethics. No, it's ethics. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure it's the same in all of our countries. I mean, and, and it's not our institutional ethics. It's the, the ethics of the NHS. Effectively, as well, they want to make sure that patients are not identifiable um, and all of that. It's it's set up for that. But yeah, asking asking. When you ask a question, you want or a number of questions. You want to be very pointed and have a rationale behind it. And you have to prove to them that you have a good reason to ask it. Otherwise, we'd be on it. Yeah. Do you think that your uh, veterinary surgeons could climb through your artery on the track lines? <laughs> Are they skilled enough to be in there to do that? That would be interesting to see, too. Yeah. I think they, uh, they, if you can get your results on the track yes. model. That would be phenomenal. I don't know. So to me, I'm not sure how hard that is. Watch how watch how quickly they then get the uh, yeah yeah. I mean, obviously, it would require more of this approval, you know, because of this validity of the procedure. Um, it's easier to put it in this month than it is in the past. So it's not. It would be approvable. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, did you try a uh, transplant? They just bunch of good kids in the city who's an injured, right? Right there. Uh, transplant? Not yet. No, it's a it's a good way forward, but not yet. All right. Thank you again. Yes, and it's my pleasure and honor to deliver a closing uh, presentation for our official program. But as I mentioned, uh, uh, we will continue our discussions uh, now that we have some uh, background information on the projects so which uh, going on in, at Kazan and in your labs, and I'm sure we would we will find ways to collaborate and, and enhance and reach each other's projects. And uh, yes, I will talk about uh, vesicles uh, as a drug delivery system. And uh, you know, well, a, a little bit background uh, about extracellular vesicles. Uh, we all know that these are small spherical uh, micro vesicles surrounded by a cytoplasmic membrane. And uh, they can be found in uh, many fluids. Almost in every uh, bodily fluid, uh, they can be found uh, in blood, lymph, saliva, sweat, urine, breast milk, cerebral spinal fluid, etc. And uh, many cells, if not all cells, in human body or animal body release these microvesicles as a part of uh, communication, intracellular communication and uh, they can uh, trigger receptor-mediated signaling and uh, deliver uh, content to target cells. 
and uh, the types of uh, microvesicles uh, uh, there are exosomes uh, which are about 40 to 150 nanometers in size um, and uh, these are microvesicles of endosomal origin multi-vesicular multi bodies uh, are actually endosomal vesicles with intraluminal vesicles and uh, mostly exosomes are formed by the uh, multi-vesicular bodies fusion with the cytoplasmic membrane and uh, microvesicles are being released uh, outside uh, actually formation of uh, extracellular vesicles is uh, in the nature is highly controlled process there is a lot of uh, cascades involved in that uh, and uh, there is a certain sorting uh, processes uh, going on uh, it means that not all the intracellular content is being packed into these uh, uh, vesicles and uh, uh, local disorganization of uh, cytoskeleton is a part of this uh, budding process and uh, extracellular vesicles uh, they uh, carry a lot of different biomolecules well of obviously they have uh, uh, plasma membrane uh, components uh, but also different uh, proteins RNA and uh, many other biomolecules uh, currently there is uh, for the uh, cell therapy or stem cell therapy there are two hypotheses one is a cell replacement hypothesis uh, where uh, transplanted cells are actually engrafting uh, and uh, replacing dying cells in the body and w which is true for example for uh, such stem cell therapy as bone marrow transplantation which is effectively transplantation of hematopoietic stem cells uh, but uh, it cannot explain many effects from for, uh, different, other different types of uh, cell therapies such as, for example, mesenchymal stem cell transplantation. And uh, there is a, a new hypothesis uh, which is speaking up strength about paracrine effect of transplanted cells uh, with uh, transplanted cells uh, releasing bioactive molecules either through their regular uh, function or uh, undergoing uh, apoptosis and uh, cell death. Uh, however, so, and uh, this is uh, why we are looking at uh, extracellular vesicles, uh, because uh, they can provide this paracrine stimulation, but uh, uh, without potential side effects of transplanting life cells and uh, so we're developing a cell-free therapy which is based on stem cells but uh, actually it's not stem cell transplantation and uh, one, of, uh, one of the ways to uh, stimulate the release of vesicles uh, is uh, affecting the cytoskeleton and uh, cytochalazine B is a well-known uh, drug which uh, disorganizes actin cytoskeleton so it's been known uh, for a long time that if you treat cells with cytochalazine B then uh, the body of, uh, from the plasma membrane will be uh, much more <coughs> intensive what we are trying to do is uh, uh, overcome the major obstacle in uh, using extracellular vesicles uh, as a therapeutic uh, agent at, at the yield because you need a lot of cells to gener uh, generate a little bit of uh, extracellular vesicles uh, which is uh, fine for uh, scientific applications and there are many papers out, uh, out there uh, describing therapeutic effect of different uh, microvesicles I will mention them later on but it's not uh, practical uh, so we are looking at ways to increase the yield and as I said uh, treatment with cytochalazine B is one of the ways to increase the budding from the plasma membrane however uh, still if you are 
looking at uh, passive release of microvesicles from plasma membrane, the amount is still not sufficient for practical application. So there is an easy uh, shortcut, mechanical disaggregation. So you basically work cells after treatment with cytokines and B, they fall apart into the many different small uh, membrane vesicles. Some of them contain uh, nuclei and other cell organelles, uh, others uh, don't. Uh, and through the series of uh, subsequent uh, centrifugations or filtration, we tried both in the lab, you can end up with a fairly homogeneous population of uh, membrane vesicles. I must say that, uh, of course, these microvesicles uh, are not uh, identical to naturally occurring microvesicles. There are no sorting events occurring during formation of these microvesicles because you just basically take up a cell as a lipid drop and uh, shake it and it falls apart on the small drops. So all the content of the cell, of the parental cell, is being randomly packed into these microvesicles. But that can be also used as an advantage because you know if you characterize the parental cell and generate uh, this kind of microvesicles from the, from it, you know that it will be a more or less representative of the parental cell and not dependent on uh, any sorting events which might uh, change uh, depending on the uh, state of the cell, of the cell culture, etc. And uh, an added bonus, and, and actually the major feature of this approach, that uh, like more than half of the biomass uh, of your cells can be converted into this type of microvesicles. Uh, so technically, in the lab, on the lab scale, you can uh, use a simple vortex and uh, subsequent centrifugation. Later on, we are planning with our industrial partners to move into the uh, large-scale biomass production of uh, cells, for example, stem cells, and uh, using industrial approaches for uh, disaggregating this uh, biomass after treatment with cytokines and B, and probably will uh, go into the uh, filtration and ultrafiltration uh, systems uh, for large-scale productions. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, natural microvesicles, uh, they serve as a vector for transferring different biomolecules from one cell to another uh, in the process of intracellular communication. Uh, so it's in their nature to transfer something, biomolecules. Uh, uh, and uh, we are trying to hijack this ability of microvesicles to transfer biomolecules to develop a new generation of uh, drugs when you can modify either pick a certain parental cell line or uh, genetically modify it for example to express certain uh, proteins or, or uh, RNA molecules or any other biomolecules so you can enrich uh, your microvesicles uh, which are producing uh, with a certain type of uh, molecules. Uh, in addition to that, uh, in the pharmacy, uh, people who work with uh, uh, liposomes, for example, uh, there is a different, uh, uh, there are a bunch of different approaches uh, which are directed at loading liposomes with different uh, drugs. And uh, these approaches can also be applied to this artificial type of microvesicles. And uh, you can do the uh, incubation with hypotonic solution, uh, you can disorganize the membrane so the uh, con outside content can enter the microvesicles, uh, the activation of of endocytosis, electroporation, and uh, different uh, combinations. So basically, uh, we haven't tried that yet, but uh, the theory is uh, fairly solid. Uh, same approaches which pharmacy using to load 
liposomes uh, could potentially be applied to these artificial types of microvesicles. Uh, for natural microvesicles, uh, there is a lot of uh, publications uh, demonstrating different types of biological activities such as anti-tumor activity uh, of microvesicles uh, from dendritic cells, uh, anti-tumor vac vaccines, uh, gene therapy using microvesicles as uh, vectors, and uh, uh, a lot of research focuses on using microvesicles in regenerative medicine because uh, they showed uh, therapeutic effect uh, in many different uh, animal models in renal injury, heart injury, liver injury, nervous system injury, hind lipid ischemia, etc. etc. There are a lot of different publications out of there. Out there. So uh, we decided in our study to uh, go through the similar route using our cytok <coughs> cytokalazin B-induced microvesicles uh, to demonstrate that their biological activity is similar to the parental cell lines and uh, can be, and so these microvesicles could be used as a substitute to naturally occurring microvesicles which everybody using in their research. Uh, the size of the microvesicles is somewhat similar to uh, extracellular vesicles, uh, arranging, well, they're a little bit larger than uh, extracellular vesicles, but uh, again, this, uh, these are pilot experiments, uh, uh, so later on we could uh, uh, optimize the technique and maybe uh, further reduce the size of uh, these microvesicles. But, uh, in general, they range from 100 to 160 uh, nanometers, and this is uh, transmission and scanning electron microscopy images. And uh, uh, not surprisingly, uh, cytoplasm and cytoplasmic content is being packaged in these microvesicles. So, uh, DID labels the membrane, uh, phalloidin. Uh, uh, labels uh, cytoskeleton. So after treatment with cytokalazin B, you have disorganization of cytoskeleton, and you can uh, observe it uh, in formed microvesicles. So very straightforward. Uh, this is uh, uh, this slide demonstrates interaction of uh, uh, membrane. Um, of microvesicles with the target cells. And you can see uh, in confocal microscope these microvesicles can uh, either fuse uh, with the cytoplasmic membrane of target cell or enter it uh, through different mechanisms, probably endocytosis, but we haven't studied that in details yet. This is just an indication that these microvesicles are readily interact with target cells. As you can see in cell culture, uh, more than 95% of cells are being labeled. So when you use microvesicles labeled uh, uh, with one dye uh, and apply it to the target cells, uh, acceptor cells uh, labeled with a different dye, uh, in vitro you get almost uh, all cells uh, with dual label. Uh, again, this is uh, just a technical experiment. Uh, it's obviously to conclude that uh, plasma membrane would be transferred to the target cells uh, along with uh, any other biomolecules packaged in the uh, microvesicles. And here we demonstrate uh, the transfer of cytoplasmic membrane, uh, transmembrane protein CD90 uh, uh, from uh, parentals, uh, from, with microvesicles from parental cells. These are uh, adipose derived stem cells, which are basically mesenchymal stem cells from adipose uh, tissue, uh, which carry the CD90 uh, molecule. This is actually one of the stem cell markers for uh, mesenchymal stem cell uh, characterization. 
and it can be transferred to the HEC293 cells which don't express this marker and again the, tr the efficiency of transfer is uh, very very high. So almost all cells after the treatment with microvesicles uh, now carry the CD90 marker uh, which came from the parental cells uh, and microvesicles. In vitro studies uh, demonstrated uh, a strong pro-angiogenic effect of uh, such microvesicles. This is a standard tube formation assay using HIVAC cells and uh, now basically we can see that uh, microvesicles have similar which is uh, uh, B uh, this uh, co-culture of uh, HUVEX cells uh, with uh, uh, SHSY, 5Y cells and you can see it's tube formation uh, index uh, similar effect uh, after you apply microvesicles to HUVEX cells and uh, C, this is uh, uh, when you use rich media, uh, special media for HUVEX cells uh, which contains uh, different pro-angiogenic uh, recombinant proteins to stimulate angiogenesis. This is positive control. I should uh, mention that we are using SHSY5Y neuroblastoma cells uh, uh, as uh, model cells because as a cancer cells, uh, they have a very strong pro-angiogenic activity, which was already described in the literature. So we just picked a cell line with a strong pro-angiogenic activity, generating microvesicles and studying pro-angiogenic activity of resulting microvesicles. Uh, studied molecular content of microvesicles and uh, basically they have a this is a Western blot analysis, this is a, a Luminex uh, uh, multiplex analysis, and you can see that uh, molecular content is similar to parental cell line, which is not surprising because you basically averages uh, the cell content. Uh, but because we have a series of centrifugations, uh, these microvesicles they don't have uh, any nuclear content because the uh, nu uh, nuclear containing microvesicles they have uh, high density and uh, they are being eliminated through the series of centrifugations. So basically, all the cytoplasmic content minus uh, nuclear content is being packaged in microvesicles. In vivo studies uh, uh, using matrigel plugs with SHSY 5Y cells or uh, microvesicles derived from these cells uh, confirmed uh, uh, pro-angiogenic activity in uh, vivo. This is just the quantification of previous uh, uh, data. Uh, of course, if you load the native uh, uh, cancer cells, uh, SHSY 5Y cells, uh, they are able to stimulate angiogenesis uh, very efficiently. Uh, if you mix microvesicles uh, into the matrigel, uh, they also able to generate angiogenesis, uh, however not uh, as efficiently as live cells. But again, this is not surprising because these cells are still live, they are biosynthesizing uh, new biomolecules, plus uh, they can proliferate uh, in the matrigel plug, which they do. So basically the biomass increases, whereas when you include microvesicles, uh, the biomass which you administered is uh, the only biomass uh, you can count on in the experiment. It will not increase. And this is an advantage that uh, you are sure that there will be no cell proliferation later on. And uh, what you administer is actually what you, uh, the effects which you will observe. And uh, this is uh, uh, new data which had not been published yet. Uh, we have uh, a model of uh, photoaging in mice where you basically uh, remove hair and treat them with uh, ultraviolet uh, uh, and that causes the skin aging. And uh, we demonstrated that uh, microvesicle treatments have similar effect to 
missing chimeral stem cell treatment in terms of uh, 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 improving collagen and elastin production and uh, vascularization to improve uh, skin uh, uh, structure. And again, uh, a lot of interest from industrial partners because that's, this is potential cosmetic application. But uh, we are also uh, this proangiogenic effects of microvesicles. So we will be applying for different uh, ischemic diseases, uh, diabetic ulcers, uh, different uh, nerve injuries. We have experiments, uh, for example, when uh, these uh, microvesicles were applied in spinal cord injury and showed promising results. So all the models which we have in the lab, uh, we will uh, we are currently testing microvesicles for their ability uh, uh, for their use as therapeutic agent. And uh, finally, uh, again, this is a very uh, a new data unpublished. Uh, we demonstrated that microvesicles uh, contain functional mitochondria. Uh, this uh, TMRE. Uh, st uh, stains is a uh, dye for transmembrane potential in mitochondria. Uh, so you can see that in, my in mitochondria, in microvesicles, uh, they contain functional mitochondria with uh, trans uh, with correct membrane potential. And uh, when you apply these microvesicles containing a mitochondria to target cells they are able to transfer this uh, mitochondria and uh, you can trace them in uh, recipient cells. Uh, the staining goes down, but that's because we are using a tra transient stain uh, meter tracker. Uh, and uh, currently we are doing experiments uh, with uh, in vitro experiments with uh, cell cultures with uh, defective mitochondria or uh, even cell cultures which don't can contain any mitochondria. Uh, our colleagues in Portugal uh, are experts in that field and we will uh, try to study whether we can achieve uh, chimerism in mitochondria uh, and uh, replace defective mitochondria through this microvesicles uh, transfer. And, uh, this is not part of the presentation, but we are working on the use of uh, microvesicles to transfer chemical drugs uh, as well. And again, uh, related to our industrial partners' uh, projects. Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Albert. Questions? Not yet, because uh, uh, basically, if you uh, you don't want to transfer any genetic material uh, to make sure that uh, uh, there will be no recombination events, there will be uh, no. We're trying to develop a, a cell-free preparation. If you try to include a uh, nuclear component, there is a risk that it will uh, result in uh, functional either cell transfer or that uh, after the transfer it's somehow in graft uh, or something. So technically we are removing all the nuclear content. Please. I guess an important question would be that do these vesicles interact or stimulate the immune system in any way? And if if so, that could be used in a positive way or it could be a negative. Yes, uh, yes. excellent question. Uh, depends on the cell type you use. Uh, if you use it autologously, uh, it will not stimulate any immune uh, and you can do the, this personalized medicine approach to generate drug for the uh, right patient. If you use it uh, in allergenic application, for example, mesenchymal stem cells, they are known to have a low immunogenicity. So technically, uh, we have, uh, well, we did uh, 
uh, preliminary studies uh, looking for the immune cell infiltration. Uh, we didn't see any pronounced immune response, but of course we need to study it in more details. But again, technically you can, uh, if you use uh, cells with low immunogenicity, uh, then uh, microvesicles will also have low immunogenicity, uh, including genetically modified cells with, with knockout of some genes uh, to lower the immunogenicity. And uh, finally, you can also, just like with blood uh, types or HLA types, you can uh, have a batches of uh, microvesicles with, for example, HLA types. Uh, the advantage is over the cellular product, additional advantage, is that these microvesicles uh, can be lyophilized and they are ready to use immediately. Uh, you don't need a high-tech cell culture lab uh, at the hospital. Uh, you, you can store it at even 4 degrees, which with studied uh, storage condition under different uh, uh, storage ability at different conditions, they're quite stable, and uh, after, the, after the storage, uh, they preserve their at least uh, pro-angiogenic effect. Uh, maybe, uh, well, and we can extrapolate it for other effects because basically biomolecules uh, uh, exert this effect. Uh, mm -hmm. So, when you show that next experiment, when you can trace what's your basal anchor in the cell, and you show that what's CD19, which is not the one here. Right? So that's what the immune system you'll see right away. You just go around and see, oh, something here which is not supposed to uh, This is a proof of principle experiment. Uh, yeah, I mean, but in life. Uh, in life, uh, not necessarily, uh, because uh, the CD90 is, uh, uh, well, if you transfer human protein, it's just you're transferred to the right place, but it's still the self protein for the body. Why would you take, for example, CD90 from the leg and inject it to the arm? You would not expect uh, immune response in the arm. So, uh, if you need, for example, to stimulate angiogenesis locally, you inject it, uh, this uh, preparation locally. And uh, uh, syngenic proteins uh, from the same species will have the biological effect, but uh, we don't expect uh, uh, immune response because, again, these are, these are self proteins. There are, uh, but if you, for example, trying to treat a hereditary disease when there is a lack of protein and you are trying to uh, administer this lacking protein, uh, then, yes, this is the same problem as with gene therapy. When you are trying to express the protein which uh, the body never saw before, uh, you can have an immune response. But again, this is a, a general problem, uh, not unique to our system. So can you just describe the whole workflow, how you see it right now, for using these vehicles in a total uh, savings for cancer? So you Start for cancer, that, yeah. for cancer. <laughs> you, you, well, where do you start? You isolate what? Stem cells from the patient? Or? In autologous. Yeah. Uh, uh, well, there are several approaches. First, you can uh, have a vaccine. You take the cancer cells from the patient, uh, you treat them uh, with cytokasin B, you generate microvesicles, and you re-administer it with maybe some adjuvants. There are approaches where people take, uh, this is a crazy idea, but there, is, uh, there are experiments uh, where people would take cancer cells, they would kill them from, by radiation or by some other treatments and re-administer it. And uh, this is one of the approaches for personalized uh, vaccine development. Uh, uh, we just discussed that they evaded the system, and now you want to work through it now. It uh, again, this is... Uh, a, a platform. You can use it any way you want. If you want to stimulate immune system, uh, you generate microvesicles from the cell, parental cells, which are able to stimulate immune system, either uh, presenting antigens uh, as a source of antigens or uh, immunomodulatory cells, which, uh, for example, uh, dendritic cells or uh, mm. mesenchymal stem cells, for example, they can reduce the 
immune system activity, other cells can increase uh, immune system activity. So by modulating the properties of parental cells, you can uh, program these microvesicles to either stimulate or not being seen by the immune system. So you first fractionize the tumor based on what you want to do. So you, you isolate the greater cells from the tumor? No, uh, this is a, uh, I'm saying that this is in principle possible. Uh, you asked about the cancer and I'm saying this is just the first approach, uh, vaccine. The second approach would be to load these uh, microvesicles uh, uh, with uh, chemotherapeutic drugs. Because uh, uh, this is a, a kind of a in pharmacy, they uh, have liposomal preparations of many drugs to increase their uh, biodistribution, stability, and solubility. But uh, using uh, chemical lipids for this uh, uh, liposomal formulations have certain disadvantages because they are toxic and they can be seen by the immune system and this kind of uh, uh, lipid formulations, they are uh, rapidly cleared from the body uh, because this is something foreign to the body. Uh, by uh, changing the artificial lip uh, lipids uh, to into the natural occurring lipids, uh, which can be harvested uh, by this procedure, we have the, uh, again, technical, this is, uh, uh, again, uh, in theory, we can make the drug formulations uh, more biosafe and uh, bioavailable so in the body. Because it's limited to the amount of material you can recover from patients, and as much drug you can put there, right? No, uh, this one would be for allergenic application, uh, mostly. Uh, however, you can, for example, uh, I uh, have an allergy um, biopsy of a fat or a bone marrow and uh, establish a cell culture, mesenchymal stem cell, for example, culture for the patient. And then uh, after a few passages, you have enough biomass to generate uh, uh, enough microvesicles. Uh, but that would be probably too expensive to uh, try. Uh, and. Uh, Companies are not so much interested in personalized medicine, they're interested in batch production. So that's why allergenic applications have more <coughs> chances of being funded uh, by the industry. But we are still uh, trying to develop the vaccine uh, approach. So you have two, uh, I wouldn't say conflicting, but always uh, different strategies. One, no, this is activating your system and other available. Yes, uh, these are various uh, applications, and not only for cancer, but also uh, cancer where we are still at in vitro part uh, using this type of microvesicles. Uh, in regenerative medicine, we are already doing experiments in pigs, for example, with spinal cord injury, and we are doing uh, small animals for different types of uh, other injuries. So. Uh, we are starting with a more straightforward approach of regenerative medicine, but uh, in a parallel developing an approach to deliver either anti-cancer agents or uh, cancer-related antigens to stimulate the immune system. Yes. Uh, I'm happy to hear that you are studying Side effects from uh, this microvesicles administration? Uh, not yet. Uh, again, we looked. Uh, we did the histology, looking at the immune system uh, uh, activation and immune cell infiltration. We didn't see any unusual uh, activities. One question I have on, the, on these sort of donor recipient transfer of proteins. When the recipient cells receive the proteins, do they seem to be as stable as the donor cell, or are they degraded because they're in foreign environment? We haven't studied that yet. Uh, uh, protein stability is very complex uh, system, uh, which HIF <laughs> uh, one uh, alpha is an example how. Uh, the fact that you have the protein by synthesis have nothing to do with the actual protein content within the cell. No, we haven't studied that yet. 
this is uh, just uh, this is a new close to the new project we worked for just a couple of years. That was fascinating. Um, so thank you again, Albert. Thank you.